Today we hear more testimonies of those who have had miracles in their lives. Join us on Our Jewish Roots with Bible Teaching in Israel by Dr. Jeffrey Sutton. To believe in the Bible is to believe in miracles. From Genesis to Revelation, the impossible became possible. As God's hand moved across space and time, Land and seas were created, graves opened, water turned to wine, the sick and lame healed, the land of Israel completely restored. Past, present, and future is the Alpha and Omega. He is the God of miracles. Thank you for joining us today. I am David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif. Well, we are ending our series, which we have really enjoyed being at this table with Dr. Seif, all about miracles. We need to hear about that, don't we? I believe so, because yes. people need heaven's help for life's assorted stuff, the hurts. Right, and we read about it in the Bible, but this program is all about hearing it from people's mouths that are living right now today. and what God is, right yes. today, what God has done in their lives. Jesus said, I will not leave you fatherless, I will come to you. It's great to hear stories about how he came today. And these are stories today in our, we call it our bonus program, but it's a, it's a program all by itself, all about people's stories, what they have walked through, and we know you're going to enjoy this. We'd like to take you right now back to the land, to Israel, to hear miracle stories from the mouths of people living today. Ray Ramirez, it is a thrill to be with you. Well, it's my joy to be with you today. Do you believe personally that God is still in the business of doing good by virtue of restoring people, the miracles of restored health, restored relationships, restored I, I, finances? Sure. Um, I, of course, I, I believe God is in the, the business of doing good and revealing himself through such things. Um, to give a personal testimony, um, I. As a young man, uh, I was in a congregation where the pastor had experienced uh, a, a miraculous healing from cancer. He had lung cancer. Um, through that healing, he, he committed himself. In fact, the way he would tell the story is he, he had a, com a prayer communication with God where he said, if you'll heal me, I'll do whatever you call me to. And he was in the hospital at the time. And, and there was a miraculous healing and the cancer was removed from his lungs and, and he, he left and, and served the Lord. And at one service, um, he was teaching on miraculous healing. And my father, again, who worked in the space program, had a gentleman that he worked with that was paralyzed in a wheelchair. Um, if I remember correctly, he had a motorcycle accident that left him, he had a spinal cord injury that left him paralyzed. And my father invited this gentleman from work, said, why don't you come? So this gentleman comes to a service in his wheelchair, into the service, the pastor's teaching, at the end there's a time of prayer. And with my own eyes, I watched a man who came in in a wheelchair that could not walk, stand up, walk, and push his own wheelchair out the door at the end of the service. Mike, it really is an honor to be with you and thank you for taking the time. You serve as a leader in one of the more significant messianic works in Israel. Beyond the miracle of your own existence and ministry here, in your own life, does the story of a miracle resonate specifically? Well, my wife and I were married for 10 years. We couldn't have children. And uh, at one point, I remember asking the Lord as we were getting ready to start having children, can we have children and what is that going to look like? And, and the Lord spoke something into my heart that at the time I didn't understand it, but he said, this is going to be a, an issue of faith for you. And uh, I thought, cool, an issue of faith. This is, th this is exactly how God always works. He had just done some miraculous things in our lives at that point. And so I was like, big, big uh, trust factor on the Lord. This is going to be an issue of faith. Won't this be fun? But then 10 years of not getting pregnant goes by. And we've gone to the doctors, had all the tests done. Finally, the doctors say, uh, this 
is what we call as unexplained infertility. There's no explanation for it. You should be able to have children. So we began to uh, fast and pray and trust the Lord for something that now we couldn't make happen and the doctors couldn't make happen. And uh, within two or three months, we finally get the phone call from the doctors, you're pregnant. And uh, for us, it, it was a miracle because there was no other explanation. We'd done everything that we could do. It is such a pleasure to be with Martha Stern. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Now that last name resonates in our culture because of your husband, David Stern. The Complete Jewish Bible was that pioneering work to, to bring to life certainly the, the Jewish connection to the Jesus story through a translation. And you were involved in behind this, correct? Yes. So when we think of a miracle and coming to faith, God interrupted kind of your sequence to, to make, manifest himself to you. I met a, a girl, I was gonna go stay in a commune and she picked me up at the airport and took me to the commune where she was also staying and she looked at me and she said, wow, you look like you need help. Why don't you try praying? And I was like, what, me pray, what, what? She said, yes, pray that God will teach you how to pray. Pray that you'll have the love of Jesus in you. And I was sort of like, what? You know, that's not me. But then I stayed together with this nice person I met, Debbie, and she was from Virginia. I ended up moving with her to Virginia and her and another friend, and um, we were reading the Bible because I figured, oh, well, I've done yoga, I've done this, I've done that. What's the difference? I'll, I'll read the Bible. So I started reading the New Testament, and I was just amazed. I was just amazed because it wasn't, it, it was about, Yeshua, Jesus, he and his friends. And I realized I wanted to be a friend of Yeshua. That was the way I, I put it. I thought, I really need to know for sure. And I sort of looked up at the sky and I'm like, God, if you're there. And then I thought, well, God, this is God I'm talking to, right? He created the whole universe. He, he, he did everything. I mean, so if, if it's really God and he's really real, he can send me a sign. I wanted something real. I didn't want to just feel good, like when you meditate, you know, you can feel good. But I wanted a sign. And I'm sitting on the beach, and I said, well, send a giant seashell. I thought, something real, though. I wanted a specific thing. I didn't want to just have a feeling. And five minutes later, this guy came walking down the beach with his dog, and he just walked on down the beach. And then five minutes later, he came back and he had this long, thin stick, like the kind when the trash guys pick up trash in the parks. It was this very long, thin stick, and it had like a, a piece of paper on it. I went to look, and it was not a piece of paper on the stick. It was this seashell. In this series, The God of Miracles, there have been so many testimonies of miracles in their lives. If you've missed any of these programs, it's easy to see them. Go to our website, levitt.com. You can see the full interview. If you have some time to sit and hear someone's incredible story, that's available for you. But right now, we want to bring you the rest of some of these stories that you've already seen through our series, The God of Miracles. Israel Hannah, and here's Jill. You don't want to miss these stories right now. Jill, we're here again. We've heard so many miracles pertaining to your life, but one more miracle to discuss, and that is about you having children. Doctor said it wasn't possible. I want to hear the story. Yeah, so I met my husband late in life. Yeah. I was uh, 37 when we met. And so we knew that if we wanted to have children, this wasn't something we could wait on. And mm -hmm. so I scheduled an appointment with my doctor. And this was the height of the pandemic, oh, mid 2020. Wow. So all appointments were virtual. Everything shut down, yeah. We met over the computer and he went over my medical history and he said, well, your labs are terrible. <laughs> Well, thank you, Doc. You know. Yeah, thank you for that. It's not the first time I've heard a doctor say something like that. Uh -huh. He said, your labs are terrible, and based on your labs, based on your age, and based on the fact that you live with cerebral palsy, I don't think that you'll ever have children. 
Mm. And then you add to that, that if you do become pregnant, there is a very small risk, although a real one, that your intracranial pressure will go beyond normal lever levels because yeah. you do live with residual hydrocephalus. From when you were born. From yeah. when I was born. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I took all of this in and we hung up the video call and we looked at each other and we just said, should we do this? because he was willing to take me on as a patient. He mm -hmm. was simply laying out the risks and the odds that were in front of me if I wanted to have a baby. Mm -hmm. And we decided to go forward mm -hmm. and I had scheduled an in-person appointment with him about three weeks into the future because that was the soonest I could get on his books. And two weeks later, I call up his office and I speak to a nurse and I say, uh, I just got a positive pregnancy <laughs> test. What do you want me to do? <laughs> so she said, well, you can go to your regular OBGYN because this was a reproductive endocrinologist. Oh, to try to get you pregnant. He's like, I I'm done right. with that. I already made it. I I've got success <laughs> now, you know? <laughs> and she said, you can go to your regular OBGYN or if you would like us to do some early ultrasound to see what we can see, mm -hmm. then we're happy to do that for you. And I said, yes. Mm -hmm. That is what I want. And so I went in and they found the heartbeat right away. Uh, they eventually graduated me from their specialized practice to my regular OBGYN. Mm -hmm. My OBGYN saw me every single month of my pregnancy mm -hmm. and gave me an ultrasound every single month mm -hmm. of my pregnancy because, again, we didn't know how living with cerebral palsy was going yeah. to affect me. Or, the, or child. the child that I was carrying. So she monitored me very closely, and when I was 38 weeks and four days, she decided to do the C-section about 10 days earlier than she had originally scheduled it mm -hmm. because she could tell that I was running out of room. <laughs> yeah. And my blood pressure wasn't horrible, but it also wasn't great. Yeah. So she decided to do the scheduled C-section and deliver our son who is perfectly healthy, wow. incredibly tall, just like his father. Um, has, and he has no medical issues has that they no thought medical he issues might have. whatsoever as a result of his birth or the fact that he was carried inside of me. Uh -huh. And uh, he is an enormous blessing to me, his dad, his Oma and Opa. Yeah. Uh, people just think he's delightful, and he really is. I'm a mom. You're a dad. I would rather go than my child. Yes. And I, I can't even fathom the fact that you would wake up and know that your daughter is gone. How, and I, how did you do that? Because I woke up, uh, you know, when I got out of ten, intensive care after 10 days, recovered for about three months from the accident. I said, I made a vow to God, I will never talk about you ever again if this is the way you treat your, those who serve you. I was an evangelist for 10 years serving the Lord with all my heart, and then my daughter gets killed in this car accident. And uh, so I just made a vow. And uh, so for a year and a half, this is where my Bible comes in, I said, uh, I'm done. I'll never speak to you again, uh, anybody about you again. And uh, on Labor Day weekend, a year and a half later, I get a call from a friend that says, up in northern Minnesota, can, would you come and be a uh, minister to us? Our pastor, it's a big time up there, what, Labor Day weekend. The church is packed. Would you come and speak? And I says, I haven't, sp I haven't spoke uh, for, for the last year and a half. Matter of fact, I, give that, I have given that up to the pastor because you're my friend. I'll pray about it. And I said, uh, uh, I, I got down on my knees and at home that night. And I said, the only way, actually the only way that I will ever preach again is if you return my Bible that was lost in that accident and has been missing for over a year and a half. That's a fleece. Yeah. That's a fleece <laughs> yeah. right yeah. there. <laughs> An hour later, it was in the evening, two hours later, there was a gunshot wound in the backyard. I called to make uh, to get, talk to the game warden. I got a hold of the, the highway patrol by mistake. The highway patrolman, I said, my name is Jim Hanna. Could you send a, 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 a game warden over? They said, your name is what? And they said, well, 
they, uh, I've got a Bible here. He laughed at you, I think. Yeah, he? he laughed at me. And he says, I have a Bible here uh, that we found underneath the seat of the car, of one of the highway patrol cars that we cleaned out. Could this Bible possibly be yours? The, the, the police officer said, I'm about to put this in, uh, you know, in the security area for, to be where it'll be just saved. If, if you had not called at this exact moment in time, it would have sat there forever and nobody would have known about it. And they returned this Bible right here in my hand after it had been lost for a year and a half. And I took this Bible on Sunday and I went and I preached for the first time at, since the accident back in that hospital because God had returned my Bible and that was a miracle. I just want to go back a little bit about your daughter who passed away again. I, we, we just can't fathom that happening to one of our children or our grandchildren, but something happened with your family. You have 12 children now. There's something to that. God is a God of restoration. He is a God who restores and will restore the things you've lost. In my Bible, uh, Joel chapter 2 talks about the restoration of all things that the, the enemy has stolen from you. And that's what for our viewing audience to understand is that we serve a God who loves us no matter what we've lost. He's, he's a pretty good bookkeeper. He's restored fivefold. I've got five beautiful daughters. Uh, tragedy, uh, difficulties, trials and tribulations will do one of two things. They'll either make you bitter or they'll make you better. I chose the, you know, to listen to the, the, the voice of the Lord, even under those difficult situations, and it made me a better person. And I encourage everyone who's going through a bitter, difficult time in their life to, to think about that and turn back to God and say, God, I really need your help. Mm. And then listen for that voice. Yes. God loves you. God is a God of, of miracles, and he will change your life if you just put your trust back in him despite everything that's happened. Our resource this week, the series, The God of Miracles on DVD. In this nine part series, we show our miraculous God at work from Genesis to Revelation with teaching from the Holy Land by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. We also hear testimonials from those who have experienced the Lord's supernatural hand in their own lives. Contact us and ask for the God of Miracles series on DVD. Remember to connect with us on social media for so much extra content. Find us at Our Jewish Roots. Well, the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Lord redeemed you in a special way, correct, Dave? He sure did. You, you know my story. I'm a pastor's son. And when my parents divorced years ago, it really kind of messed up. He wasn't only my, my father, but he was my pastor. And um, I wasn't close enough to the Lord to be able to handle that situation. So at a young age, actually I was 25, 30 years old, I ended up in Hollywood, California. We're from San Diego, California. I ended up in Hollywood. I was trying to make it in secular music and doing just about anything I could to make it in secular music. MTV, you know that, that <laughs> station. I got to tell you what happened to me last night. We were in our hotel room. I was flipping through the channels and MTV came on and I was reminded that I wanted to be on MTV back in the day and I was watching just for a second and I watched this guy on a high rise just fall back to his death during a song. I couldn't believe it. And I'm just thinking, I wanted to be on MTV. I wanted to be in that family and I'm so thankful that I listened to that voice that small voice for two years of my life when I was trying to make it on my own and God would say, Dave, you need to sing for me. You need to live for me. When I accepted that and came back to him, have a family, I have two children, grandchildren, and I'm so thankful. I was gonna say what's neat is you wanted to make it in secular music so bad when you gave it back to him uh, to brag on my husband a bit, he's in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, and that happened after he gave his life back to the Lord. Recommitted. That, yeah. That's a beautiful story, and I'm shocked by how bombastic 
uh, footage of someone falling to their death and that transitioning, oh my word, I don't know what you, a great testimony. I don't know if you watched the Grammy Awards recently where there was a guy dressed as Satan and the song that they sang was called Unholy and I wanted to be a part of that. I'm so glad that I knew better yes, as a child. Me too. Yeah. You're going to see some uh, testimonies now from individuals of students that are Bible college students. I'm their professor. I ask who'd like to share. You're going to see some examples of those that said they wanted to do it. You are a daughter of a missionary, are you not? You were in Costa Rica? Yes, sir. I lived there for three months. And one night, it was the middle of the night, and it was like four in the morning, and I'm asleep. My sister's in the bed next to me, and we're both asleep, sound asleep. It was great. And I feel something on my leg, and I lean oh. down to swipe it off my leg because our house is infested with cockroaches. So I just thought, oh, must be a cockroach in my bed. That's typical for Costa Rica. Yeah, right. It's very normal. <laughs> um, no screens on the windows, so bugs oh, came wow. all the time. So it's, it was a normal thing. Uh -huh. Just thought it was like a normal bug. I swipe it off, and it stings my hand. And I jump out of bed, freaking out, wake my sister up. And so I turn the lights on, and I'm like, just help me move like the blanket around so we can find out what it is. So we flip the sheet over. There's nothing there. And she's like, wait, there's something heavy on this side of the sheet. So we flip it back over, and there was like a scorpion like this big yeah. in the bed. And I'm freaking out. I run to my dad's room, and I'm like, Dad, there's, there's, and I'm like, like freaking out. My sister from the other room yells, there's a scorpion in our room. So my dad jumps out of bed, grabs a bowl and a spoon, and he runs in, and he smacks the scorpion, scoops it up. He spoons him to death. He spoons him to that death. That is a man after my own heart. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> I love it. Tosses it outside, comes back inside. My hand is like swelling Ooh. and red. And I was like, Dad, can you just pray for my hand? Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what else to do. Like, can you just pray for it? So he prays for my hand and the pain leaves instantly. And we're like, okay, uh -huh. like, praise the Lord. Like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So my hamstring was torn, like the muscle, but um, in that, it also had ripped off a tiny piece of my growth plate, oh. like where my leg connects to my hip. My youth pastors were pushing me to go to this youth camp. And of course I was like, absolutely not, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And then my mom ended up making me go. Um, and then one night I was during worship, I was feeling like, okay, I'm obviously here for a reason. So let's see what God is really about. Like, let's see if he'll do anything. Yeah. I kind of like put my hands up. I had never been like really engaged in the Holy Spirit. So yeah. I had no idea what that looked like. Yeah. And so I was like, <laughs> and then this girl came up to me and she was like, hey, can I pray for your leg? And I don't know how she knew because I was wearing pants. So even though it was taped, like yeah. she couldn't see anything. But I was like, yeah, sure. After a few minutes praying, like I noticed the pain that I had been feeling every day, like all the time, it just stopped. And she prayed for a little bit after that. Um, and then she stood up and she's like, hey, do you feel anything? And I was like, yeah, like it doesn't hurt. Wow. And she didn't say anything else. She just walked away. Yeah. And after that, like I went outside, I tumbled a lot and I never felt any pain again. I purposely vocal abused my voice. Like I just pushed myself to limits. Mm -hmm. I'd go past things I shouldn't have. The physical part, it became a raspiness. Even mm -hmm. if other people could not hear it, I heard it. Oh, wow. I call it scar. I called it scars in the back of my throat. I believe they were there, like, yeah. It just... I'm pretty sure I had vocal nodules at least twice. I had like wow. every, just about every symptom you could think of. Mm -hmm. And then one day, the professors were talking about how they would help their vocal students like find their identity, uncover their identity of the voice God gave them. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. And I thought, huh, God, it would be really nice to have my old my old voice back mm -hmm. because before when I was a kid I hated my voice so much that I covered it like I changed the tone and the yeah. sound of it I did not like that sound either so I covered again mm -hmm. but God <laughs> when I was in chapel and just praising God mm -hmm. I felt something shift just I felt my old voice come back like the voice I had when I was like fourth or fifth grade, wow. the childish voice came back. Yeah. And then over the week, he took that childish voice and matured it into a young lady's voice. There was a man of God, the general overseer of redeemed Christian Church of God, who came to Kenya to, to, to inaugurate a new parish. Yeah. And then he prayed, because we've had several miracles, according to Acts chapter 19, yeah. verse 12, 
when said God wrought so many miracles through Apostle Paul. That's right. And then the sick were healed, yes. many of the diseases because of the handkerchief, just by touching. That's right, scripture. It's by faith. So we yes, prayed on right. the handkerchief and the handkerchief was given to us. I just kept the handkerchief inside my bag. I didn't touch it. We moved to Uganda. I think the hotel I was staying, I had to go behind the hotel to buy bread, just bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went into um, a confessionary store. Another woman touched me. He said, man of God, can you pray for me? She said, I've got three of my children upstairs in the same building where I was buying the bread. Yeah. That they were sick, they've been hospitalized for the past two days. Oh. And I said, what happened? He said they had viruses and they just kid, I don't want to lose them. And the Holy Spirit ministered to me that you had an handkerchief given to you. That's so right. I was struggling in my heart. It was my first trip to Uganda. Now, why should I go over there? Imagine if you go there now, you pray and nothing happens. Then I had to build up my faith. That's right. I took the handkerchief mm -hmm. and I moved down. On getting there, I found all the children lying on the bed with drapes handed over to them. And I had to play with the kids, started, you know, sense of humor. And I took out the handkerchief. Mm -hmm. I held their hands and I prayed. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. That every form of infirmity in the life of this children, the Lord take it off. I prayed in faith. And then the kids were laughing, they were, they were excited. And I left. Yeah. The second day in the morning, the woman called me that, praise God that my family had been discharged by the doctor. Wow. If you are watching us right now, I know that you have a testimony. You have a miracle that you've had in your life. I encourage you to share it with somebody who needs to hear it. Nothing changes a life more than hearing someone else's story of coming to faith and story of miracles. There's more on our social media sites. Look up Our Jewish Roots. We have extended interviews. It is worth your time to sit down and listen to those stories. But unfortunately, right now, we are out of time. Yes, it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for spending 28 minutes with us. Come again next week. Until then, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There you can order this week's resource or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries helps us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.